Hey guys, my name is Cody Sedergren. I'm a fourth year pharmacy student. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit of the tr about the treatment of status asthmaticus. So going through school, pharmacy school, I actually did not learn about status asthmaticus until my fourth year. Um, I was actually on a hospital rotation and we had uh, the first patient uh, with status that the hospital had ever seen and they didn't have a protocol in place. So one thing that I got to do on this rotation was actually help develop a protocol um, that's actually implemented into the hospital today. And so I'm going to go with, over with you a little bit about what I learned and the research that I did into this. So the objectives for this uh, presentation. First, we're going to define the epidemiology of status asthmaticus. We'll then understand the goals of status asthmaticus therapy. We'll outline the treatment of status asthmaticus. And finally, we'll summarize provider techniques for preventing exacerbations. The epidemiology of status asthmaticus. So status asthmaticus is an acute severe asthma exacerbation that does not respond to rescue therapy, such as um, use, using an albuterol inhaler. Thinking of the pathophysiology of asthma, it's a chronic inflammatory disorder that um, occurs in the airways and it results in episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, and cough. Um, this inflammation kind of, it causes uh, obstructed airflow in the lower lungs. And so with these patients, they have a hard time expelling the air out of their lungs. Um, in these patients, you mostly see it at night or early in the morning. Um, as when I was discussing the patient that I actually saw in my institutional rotation, he actually came in first thing in the morning. Um, the key hallmark of asthma is that it, it, it can be relieved. It is reversible. Um, asthma is the most common cause of hospitalization in children in the United States, and it counts for around 500,000 admissions into the pediatric intensive care unit. Males and African Americans have a higher risk of death versus females and white Americans. This is an important population demographic to think about. Goals of therapy with status asthmaticus. First off, we want fast reversal and correction of airflow obstruction. That's going to be due to this inflammation that I talked about. Um, with these patients, the inflammation is really going to ha cause them to have a hard time expelling the air, and so they can become overloaded with oxygen. When we correct this inflammation and allow the normal breathing, um, we will be able to correct the hypoxemia and the severe hypercapnia that they're experiencing. And finally, we want to reduce the likelihood of hospitalization and recurrence at discharge. So without further ado, we'll step into the treatment of status asthmaticus. So for initial treatment, um, this is most commonly going to occur in the emergency department. Um, first thing we want to do is measure the uh, oxygen saturation. If it's below 90%, we want to give the patient supplemental oxygen to maintain those levels at least at 90%, if not above. Innovation um, in these patients really should be avoided. Um, there's a high risk of pneumothorax in these patients, and so it should be considered last-line therapy. Um, the only time you're going to use this is when the patient presents with apnea or coma. You're going to monitor the SAO2 until a clear response to bronchodilator therapy has occurred. So the next thing you want to move into is the assessment of severity. To do this, you want to utilize the Pediatric Respiratory Assessment Measure, or the PRAM score. There are other uh, assessment measures out there. Um, this is the one that studies have really been looking towards, and this is kind of what they're pushing towards being the um, easiest and most efficacious in utilizing, especially in emergent situations like this. It's super simple, easy to use. So the different categories of signs that you want to look for is uh, suprasternal retractions. So that's going to be um, the skin on the neck. Is it going in and force the air in? Um, scaling muscle contractions. So that's going to be the muscles that are going to move your first ribs, your clavicle, the top of it. Air entry, do you want to, you want to see if it's decreased at the bases or if it's widespread decrease? Wheezing, so you need to see if that's in expiratory or inspiratory and oxygen saturation. Um, that's one of the big things that you want to continuously check in these patients. So it breaks it down into different severities. Mild is considered a score of 0 to 3, moderate is 4 to 7, and severe is 8 to 11. So if you classify your patient in the mild to moderate severity, um, first thing you want to do is after starting the supplemental oxygen is um, 
administer the albuterol. So if the patient is less than 12 years old, you're going to administer 0.15 milligrams per kilogram, and you want to use a minimum of 2.5 milligrams um, every 20 minutes for three doses, and you're going to re reassess the PRAM score in between each dose. Um, if there's no improvement after the third dose, you want to give uh, increase it to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram with a max of 10 milligrams every two hours is needed with continuous reassessment. Um, if the patient is greater than or equal to 12 years old, you want to use 2.5 milligrams every 20 minutes for three doses and assess for improvement once again um, using the PRAM score. If there's no improvement after the third dose, go ahead and give 5 milligrams every two hours with continuous reassessment. The next thing to think about is epitropium administration. So this can be used objectively with the albuterol. And the dose for that is a half a milligram every 20 minutes for three doses then as needed with the albuterol. Um, this should only be used in the emergency department. What they found with this is that it decreased hospital admissions, but it did not, once the patient was admitted, it did not decrease the length of stay in these patients. So it's really not effective in actually making the patient better once they do are admitted. So if your patient initially presents um, in the severe category, you want to automatically go ahead and start them on the continuous albuterol. Um, if they're under 12 years old, you want to use half a milligram per kilogram per hour for one hour continuously, and then you want to reassess after that hour. Um, if they're greater than or equal to 12 years old, you want to use 10 to 15 milligrams per hour with the maximum dose of 20 milligrams for one hour, and then once again reassess the PRAM score on those patients. And the next thing that you want to use in these patients that are in your severe category is magnesium sulfate. So the dosing for administration of this is going to be 25 to 50 milligrams per kilogram, bolus IV over 30 minutes, and the max dose for that's going to be 2 grams. Some things to know with magnesium is that it has shown sig uh, significant improvement in FEV1. That's usually seen between the first and second hour. So once you get hit beyond that first hour threshold, you really start seeing it kick in. Um, the continuous infusion of magnesium has demonstrated to be pretty well tolerated, and there aren't many complications out there. But um, just to note that beyond four hours, there really hasn't been much clinical effic efficacy evaluation done. So that's kind of really the max amount of time that we really want to infuse magnesium. Um, current data really has looked, has um, shown a lot of support for the use of magnesium sulfate over other adjunctive therapies such as terbutaline and norepinephrine, um, especially when used adjunctively to um, inhaled beta-2 agonist. So one thing that you want to do regardless of the severity is utilize the systemic corticosteroids in your status asthmaticus patients. So they've done studies looking at the best route to take it, um, or whether it's going to be intravenous, intramuscular, or orally. And they really found out that they're equally efficacious. And that's why um, when it comes to these steroids, oral is going to be preferred because it's going to be the le least invasive, um, especially in an emergent situation. You don't want to have to worry about trying to get an IV line going if it's absolutely not necessary. So you're dosing with this, um, your prednisone, your methylprednisolone, and your prednisolone. Um, and your patient's less than 12 years old. You're going to use 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram and two divided doses daily for five days. Um, and the maximum dose on that's going to be 60 milligrams per day. And patients 12 years old or older, you want to use 40 to 80 milligrams per day in a single or two divided doses. And you're going to do this again for a duration of five days. One um, medication that's really gained some traction and has become pretty popular around here is dexamethasone. It's good, the dosing for that is going to be 0.6 milligrams per kilogram um, once, and then you'll repeat that dose in 24 to 36 hours. Um, with that, um, it's also going to be a maximum dose of 16 milligrams. With dexamethasone, only two doses are needed for the regimen. Um, clinical data has shown that dexamethasone had no difference in relative risk of relapse when compared to prednisone, and actually showed to be a lot less likely to cause steroid-induced vomiting. So this really takes you through the first hour of treatment, um, whether it was the hour of 
the three doses of albuterol with the vitropium or it's the hour of continuous albuterol administration, um, it really should be completed at this point and then you can move on to the second hour of treatment. The first thing you want to do is reassess the pediatric respiratory assessment measure or PRAM score. Um, you'll want to reclassify them whether or not their um, uh, severity has increased or decreased. So patients that are can still in the moderate severity, you want to go ahead and bump them up to the continuous albuterol. Um, it's going to be the same dosing as before. Um, and then you want to do a continuous reassessment with these patients to see when um, they actually show some improvement. If they're still classified as a severe severity and you haven't administered the magnesium sulfate, this is the point at which you want to go ahead and start this in these patients. So the patients that are still in the severe category, um, this is what's known as throwing the kitchen sink at them. Basically, you're going to do whatever you can to kind of try and break what is going on with them and decrease this inflammation and allow them to start breathing. Um, you really want to have them admit, uh, admitted to the critical care unit or the pediatric ICU if you have that in your hospital. Um, first thing that you can try is beta-2 agonist I IV push. Um, and you're going to do that with either terbutaline or epinephrine. So the terbutaline dosing is going to be 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram subcutaneous every 20 minutes for the three doses and repeat every two to six hours as needed. Um, the maximum dose on that is going to be 0 0.25 milligrams. With epinephrine, less than 12 years old, it's going to be 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram subcutaneously every 20 minutes for three doses. Um, the maximum on that is going to be a half milligram per dose. For ages greater than or equal to 12 years old, it's going to be a half milligram subcutaneously every 20 minutes for three doses. Um, if your patient is really low weight or frail, um, you really want to use a lower dose, and so it may be better to go to 0.3 milligrams. The reasons that you want the, your patient admitted to critical care is so you could really um, assess and keep a constant monitor on their vitals. The next step up beyond this is starting a beta-2 agonist IV drip. Um, again, you're going to be looking at the same two drugs, first being terbutaline. Uh, this one has a loading dose, so you can do 2 to 10 micrograms per kilogram. Um, the fusion dose is going to be 0 0.08 to 0.4 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And you may titrate this up by 0.1 microgram per kilogram per minute every 30 minutes based on patient response and toxicity. Um, the maximum dose that you want to do on this is 3 micrograms per kilogram per minute. With the epinephrine, the starting dose on this is going to be 0 0.05 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And you may titrate up by 0 0.05 to 0.2 micrograms per kilogram per minute every 10 to 15 minutes based on the patient response. And the maximum dose on this is going to be one microgram per kilogram per minute. So um, this is kind of looking at the clinical improvement of the patient. So once again, you'll use your PRAM score to uh, assess these patients. So a patient is considered a poor responder if their PRAM score is greater than eight or their PCO2 is greater than 42 millimeter of mercury. Um, with these patients, you need to continue their therapy in the critical care unit. Um, you want to provide them the oxygen supplementation to um, achieve and maintain an oxygen saturation of greater than 90%. You want to continue the beta agonist hourly or continuously. Um, continue the systemic corticosteroids and continue the adjunct therapies. Incomplete responders are considered patients with a PRAM score of 4 to 7. You want to continue therapy in the hospital ward. Um, once again, providing the oxygen supplementation, the beta agonist, and um, systemic corticosteroid. All right, and a patient is considered a good responder if the PRAM score is less than three. At this point, the patients may be discharged home. You want to continue the treatment with the beta agonist and systemic corticosteroids until the full duration is done, and they should schedule a follow-up with the primary care provider within one to four weeks. So for prevention of exacerbations, um, just
just some things to keep in mind as a provider is you want to ensure the patient is current on all immunizations, especially their flu shots. That's one that people seem to forget. You want to identify and minimize asthma triggers and environmental exposure. Um, things like that would be included in this is smoke, mold, pollen, and dust mites. You want to assess symptom control, inhaler technique, and medication. Um, you definitely want to um, assess whether or not they need to be um, have their medication adjusted, if they need to go up on therapy, things like that. And the big thing is you need to create an asthma action plan. So this is an asthma action plan, and this is taken straight from the guidelines. Um, and this essentially just goes over how they treat and manage their asthma. All right, guys, that's all that I have. So uh, I want to thank you for watching.